morning. Good morning. How y'all doing today? It was rainy, then it's sunny. Maybe it'll rain again. Florida's a weird place, isn't it? <laughs> We're going to talk about that today. Welcome if you are new here. My name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I am also excited to be continuing in our Corinthians series. This is where we are looking at the biblical books of First and Second Corinthians letters, actually, by Paul the Apostle to the church in Corinth, where they are having some issues. So some would call them crazy. So we are asking the overlying question throughout this whole series, are we any different? I think we got the answer already, but we're just going to keep asking again and again and again. <laughs> Before we begin... I want to talk a little bit about clothing. Last week I talked about clothing. If you were here, you remember I talked about my seersucker shirt. The dangerous word to say, seersucker, but it's fun. I talked about how we move down here from the north and we start dressing different because we're just a stone's throw away from the beach. If you're watching online, we're in a beach place. So we gotta dress like we're in a beach place, right? We wear linen pants, seersucker shirts, crazy things. I moved down here from New York several years ago, and I made a vow, actually, <laughs> that I would never wear shoes, socks, or pants again. Get your mind out of the gutter. I'm talking about shorts. No more long pants. As you can see, I broke the vow. It didn't work out for me, I'll tell you why, even though you didn't ask. It's because I started leading worship down here, and the pastor at the time did not like the fact that I was wearing sandals and shorts on the worship stage. I got hairy legs. It's a problem. <clears throat> so, he let me know he didn't like it in a very roundabout way, right? We do that as Christians, right? We walk all around, talk all around like what we really mean. I don't like that. I like to get right to the point. He didn't. So here's kind of kind of how he told me, with some of the embellishment that you would expect from me, if you know me. So I kind of like this. I'm just doing the better version. You know, Gene, I've been watching a lot of worship videos, a lot of worship teams, like you know, Hillsong and stuff like that. I noticed there are a few common denominators when we watch these worship teams, a few things. Among them are, it seems that they always cover their feet up with things called shoes. Maybe you've heard of them. They come in a wide variety. You can get boots, boots, shoes, they're shoes. You can get nice like leather shoes if you want to be fancy. If you want to be athletic like JD from Hillsong, you know, you can get sneakers and jump around a lot. That's fine. Also, doesn't stop there. They cover their legs up entirely. Like, you know, not just the top part, but the shins and calves too, where all the hair is. They cover them up real good. Again, a variety. Denim, linen even. We're in Florida. Go for it. They go all the way down and touch the shoes. And just in case they don't, they have things called socks that you put on underneath the shoes so that there's no way any hair is going to show. So being from New York, I picked up what he was putting down within the first few words. Waited for him to finish and said... If you don't want me wearing sandals and shorts on the worship stage, why don't you just say that? Right? But, well, I did what he said, as you can tell, and started wearing shoes and socks, as some of you know who follow me, online. Because, like Paul, I can be all things for the sake of the gospel. Right? We saw that in 1 Corinthians 9. I have become all things to all people so that... I may, by every possible means, save some. Now I do all this because of the gospel, so I may become a partner in its benefits. All right, it's not as difficult as what Paul did, but you get my point. It's a little baby step. So he continues on in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 with this idea by saying, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. That's where we are. We're in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And we can see here that we have some themes. There are chapter themes. Remember, I've been saying this. In the original letters, they didn't have numbers in them, right? It just flowed like a continuous flow. So you have themes that go over a number of different chapters. 
chapters 1 through 4, disunity caused by following after earthly leaders instead of Jesus, earthly wisdom instead of godly wisdom. 5 through 7, sex, sexual sin. 5, 6, 7, as it relates to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. 8 through 10, meat sacrificed to idols. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch the sermon on chapter 8. You can do that through the app. Now we arrive at a new theme, my favorite. This is my favorite section of 1 Corinthians 11 through 14, things in the worship service. So that will give us all of our context. That's what we're going to have to remember here because there's some tough stuff in these chapters that a lot of people take out of context because they don't remember the context. It is in the worship service. So that's the umbrella that we have to have over everything we learn about here. So chapter 11 is interesting. Two different main subjects, but the overlying kind of micro theme here that we're going to look at is cultural and social divisions. Cultural and social divisions. That's what causes a lot of these problems. So how do we imagine church? If I said, hey guys, we're going to take a field trip to Europe and we're going to go to a church there. Kind of cool, right? Now, Maybe if we were going to Scotland, you'd imagine like a stone church, right? With all the beautiful mountains and stuff like that. And it might be like a medium-sized church, and it's all old and stone, almost like ruins or something like that. If we were going to France, you'd imagine a cathedral, right? Stained glass, beautiful architecture, stone. Let's say we're going to New England, and we're going to church. What would you imagine? I imagine like a white wooden building. Maybe it doubles as a schoolhouse from the 1800s, something like that. Hey, guys, we're going to a modern church. You're going to picture this, like they got a stage, some screens, some seats, coffee, greeters, stuff like that. They're always asking you for your information. (laughs) Can't imagine that when we look at the church in Corinth. It's not the way we should view it. You got to view it like this. There we go. That's what the church in Corinth kind of looked like. Now, that's not actually a church picture. They didn't have iPhones yet then, just Blackberries. They didn't have the cameras on them. So this is not really exactly what the church looked like. They might not have the statue as goddess or whatever it is there, but it's the basic setup. That's kind of what we're looking at here. They had what's called a triclinium. It's a fancy word, triclinium. And you'll probably notice something. They're reclining. That's what they did. They reclined. They didn't sit like this in chairs all the time. Now, if you're observant and you have a good memory, you've probably read this in the Gospels and remember they said this. Take a look at John 13. One of his disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close beside Jesus. Last Supper, Mark 14, 18. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, I assure you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me, Judas. Right? It's the main point, but there's those little nuggets in there. They kind of recline. They would recline sometimes around a table, lower table, and sometimes in a triclinium setting. It's important. I want you guys to have the right picture of what is happening here in your minds, right? They don't have the church. It's in a home setting, usually maybe with wealthier people so they could fit 30, 50 people in the home church. They were persecuted first by the Jews, then the Romans. They weren't allowed to build churches. That didn't happen for a long time. So they were forced to be in a home church. So while we look at that for the text today, keep this in your mind. And imagine that he's talking about the people who are kind of like in the middle there doing their thing. They're prophesying. They're praying. They're teaching. And the people are gathered around them in this triclinium type of setting. And this is what Paul says. These are the issues. It's going to sound a little weird, but I'll put it together for you if you don't understand it. 1 Corinthians 11, 2. Now I praise you because you always remember me and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who prays or prophesies with something on his head dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since that is one and the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman's head is not covered, her hair should be cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, she should be covered. Explain that to you. But first, 
I want you to back pocket something if you've been following along. Put it in a little folder in your mind for when we get to chapter 14. Note, women are prophesying and praying in church. They're doing what? Speaking in church. Save that for chapter 14. It will be important. So, some backgrounds here. <clears throat> what you have is kind of a clash of cultures coming together. You have to understand that to get this text right. So you have Jewish believers, and then you have now Gentile believers, anyone who is not Jewish, specifically Greeks and Romans. And they're all coming in together in this setting. They're coming from different cultural places. Remember, I've told you at first, it was a Jewish sect. Now, Gentiles are coming in. If you pay attention, again, when you read the Gospels, Jesus does not really interact with a whole lot of Gentiles, non-Jewish believers. In fact, in one case, he protests it. He doesn't want to interact. He came for the lost sheep of Israel. It's not until Matthew 28, right? The end <laughs> where he says, now go to all the ethnicities. Go to everybody else now. They don't quite get it. We look at the history of the early church. Acts, Jesus ascends into heaven. After that, the Holy Spirit. Chapter 10, until Peter gets the visions, right? Hey, go to the Gentiles. Oh, now I get it. And then there's Cornelius. Not till chapter 11, verse 26. It's called Christianity for the first time in Antioch. But even still, they're still calling it a way or a sect, a Jewish sect, almost to the end of Acts chapter 24, when Paul's on trial before Felix. This is what the lawyer, bringing up the charges against him, says. Acts 24, 5. For we have found this man, Paul, to be a plague, an agitator among all the Jews throughout the Roman world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Jesus is from Nazareth. So it's considered a Jewish sect of the Nazarenes, and it's called that to a pretty late date. Now, though, the Gentiles are coming in. We're in Corinth. <clears throat> now we're welcoming in different customs, specifically Hairstyles. Hairstyles and co-ed banquets, worship services. So as far as the hairstyles are concerned, you have to think rightly about the Jewish culture. They cover their heads. Picture Middle Eastern women. They're covered like that. Maybe not the face, but the hair is covered. Orthodox Jews today still cover their heads. Romans do not. Have you ever seen like Gladiator or something like that? You know, the women have their hair all really long and braided and it's super, super fancy. So in both cultures at that time, hair is a sex symbol. So the Jewish people being conservative are going to cover it up. The Romans, not so much. Now they're coming together. Also, Jewish and earlier Greeks even would separate the men from the women in their social gatherings. Kind of like if you ever go to a life group or a Bible study with anyone who's really conservative, right? Even though it's a co-ed group, what do they do? They separate the men and the women, even though the pastor told them it's a co-ed group. <laughs> but they still separate it out. Right? So the guys, you go over there, you have your beer and cigars, women, tea, you go over there and gossip. And that's, <laughs> that's kind of what they do, right? They're, they're old-fashioned. <clears throat> so imagine that. All right? Imagine that, that the Jews are going to be thinking this way. Now remember, Jewish Christians, they became Christians. They're going to be thinking that way. While the Romans, not so much. But now you have this home group <laughs> where they're all meeting together. And it can cause some scandal and temptation. Maybe you have a couple on their way home in the car from the church in Corinth. <laughs> and they just see if you guys are awake. <clears throat> And maybe they have a domestic dispute in the car. This causes problems, right? So maybe the woman, she gets upset because Jenny in the worship service wouldn't cover up her hair. She's like, I saw you checking out Jenny's hair. No, no, I didn't, no, no, no. I was just looking at her face. I have to look at her face. She was prophesying, talking quiet, couldn't understand it, reading lips. No, no, no. You were looking at her hair. You like her hair better than my hair. No, I love your hair. Your hair's great. It's great. Your hair's wonderful. I made a big mistake. He's not complimenting her when she gets back from the beauty salon. <sighs> you know what? No, you were checking her out. And I'm going to teach you a lesson. 
Next week, I'm going to take my hat off in church. No, 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 you heard what Paul said. Don't do that. Keep your hat on in church. We'll deal with... No, no, no. I'm going to take it off in church and let it all hang out. <laughs> you like that, right? Like Aquaman. He learned all his moves from like 80s metal videos. I'm convinced. Okay, base, we're going to stay on the notes today. <laughs> but this could happen, right? Jenny doesn't cover her hair. Guy's drooling over it, distracting during the worship service. Cover your hair, Paul says. Come on. You're being a distraction. <laughs> so it's kind of akin to somebody wearing like a bathing suit or maybe shorts <laughs> up here on the worship stage, right? It's distracting. Cover it up. So this is why Paul says this. 1 Corinthians 11.10. This is why a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels? Huh? <laughs> I'll explain that to you. It's kind of my job. <clears throat> Genesis 6, that's probably what Paul's alluding to. If you've read your Bible, you know this is the cause of the flood. You have the angels, the sons of God, they enter the daughters of men. God does not like that union, and so he floods the whole earth. So Paul is making an exaggerated statement to get their attention. Maybe there are angels in the worship. You don't want to be attracting them. Cover it up. Or he'll flood the place again. No, he promised not to. So you get the point. <clears throat> He's alluding most likely to that. The men, what's the deal there? Well, again, we have to understand the culture. Pagan worship. The men would cover their head, right? maybe out of reverence or respect for the false god, or so that they're not distracted while they're praying. They'll bring their toga up over their head. So, here's a problem that we commonly run into in church, is that people want to rush into the text lazily without doing their homework. And that's unfortunate, because this is how we, add up, we end up with like a lot of bad traditions, or just silly things that we do without understanding why. It's important to think this way. Remember, I told you about my emails. <laughs> imagine, just imagine this. Someone 2,000 years from today looking at our texts or emails. Think about it. Think about it. Do you assume that the language will be English in 2,000 years? It wasn't 2,000 years ago. Maybe they don't have the same language. Have we reverted back to hieroglyphics? <laughs> I mean, some of my texts, some of you know, I'm not going to look over there at Phil, but some of the texts that go back and forth between us, <laughs> I joked, I'm like, would anyone read this not knowing us and say, yes, this is a doctor and a pastor talking to one another? No, I don't know. I think it looks like two eighth or ninth graders. <laughs> All the emojis and funny pop culture references. Think about what you'd have to know to understand it, really. Like I referenced Jerry Springer, right? If you're in this culture, that brought a whole story into your mind with one name. Think about what I did, right? You've got a picture of people throwing chairs around and fighting and that big guy breaking them up, you know? You had a whole thing going through your head and all you needed to do, one name, two words, done. Paul, angels, bang. If the readers knew the story, they'd go, oh, yeah, and it brought a whole picture into my mind. The flood, all this stuff. I thought about Noah, I was like, oh yeah, that's right, that happened. 2,000 years from now, it's not going to do anything unless they study the culture, the history, <laughs> and the language. On top of that, the dialect. Different things we say depending on where we're from. Totally different. Morning, y'all. That's what I said. What does that mean, right? We use different words. LOL. That wasn't a thing 30 or 40 years ago. Hopefully it won't be a thing 30 or 40 years from now. But what does that mean? You'd have to study the dialect, not just the language. The New Testament's written in Koine, said wrong, really, Kini Greek, common Greek. It's a certain kind of Greek. It's not exactly like Greek is today. You have to know that and the nuances to get what Paul is saying. So a good teacher will get underneath the text to deliver the right information so that we're not doing silly stuff in church, <laughs> like making women cover their hair up it's not necessary. It's not what he's talking about, and it's not a part of our culture. It leads to things like, people, we've got to take your hat off in church, men. You've got to take your hat off. But the women, they wear these big elaborate hats. 
The text is about modesty. What does a big elaborate hat have to do with modesty? So you miss the whole point when you don't understand the text. But here's the other side of it. There's always a both with me. I'm very difficult. Like the hats. Everything is permissible. But not everything is profitable. Not everything builds up. So that's been kind of a theme we've been seeing, right? Guys, you can eat the meat sacrificed to the idols. You can do this. You can do that. You can do that. But does it build up? Is it helpful? So with the proper understanding of the text, I have the liberty to wear shorts and sandals. I could have said no to the pastor. Nope, not going to do it. But was it helpful if I did that? Would it be respectful? No. I could wear a baseball hat. Would it be helpful? It isn't. There's actually a very famous worship leader, <clears throat> I won't mention any names, who wears a baseball hat when he leaves worship. And every time they post something by him, always comments about it. Always people freaking out about the hat. It's disrespectful, it's irreverent, what is he doing? Blah, 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 blah. Well, he has the right to do it, but is it building up or is it distracting people? So if I'm his pastor, that's the question I'm going to ask. I'm going to say, yes, smarty pants, you know the text, you can wear the hat. Fantastic. What point did you prove? But in the comments section of your video, there are 700 people talking about your hat instead of Jesus. Take the hat off, right? So it's a both. We have the liberty to do these things, but Remember what Paul said about the weaker member. We don't want to cause the weaker people to stumble. Right? All things for the sake of the gospel. So we arrive at another thing here. <clears throat> He's going to start talking about the Lord's Supper. Communion, if you don't know what the Lord's Supper is. And he moves from these cultural divisions into social divisions. So if we go back to the triclinium, <clears throat> we have things called the high places. If we're watching or thinking of like a medieval banquet, in your mind, the high place might be at the head of the table there, at the far end, right? That's where the king and queen would be probably, right? So that could be a high place. In this culture, it was probably on the sides, so say some biblical scholars. I don't know why. It doesn't matter. They have high places. Jesus talks about this too in the Gospels, if you were paying attention. He rebukes the Pharisees. One of the things he says about them is this, Matthew 23, 6. They love the place of honor at the banquets, the front seats in the synagogues. But here's how he teaches on it. We jump to Luke 14, starting at verse 8. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, could be like that, don't recline, catch that, at the best place because a more distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come and say to you, Give your place to this man. And then in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and recline in the lowest place so that when the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. You will then be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus probably has in mind Something like this from Proverbs 25.6. Don't brag about yourself before the king and don't stand in the place of the great. For it is better for him to say to you, come up here, than to demote you in plain view of a noble. So you have these aristocratic banquets going on. <clears throat> They'd occur in the home. So this could be before the people came to faith. You have these parties all the time, kind of like we would, but especially the wealthy people who own these homes would have banquets all the time, parties. Maybe even after they come to the faith, they keep doing it, which is okay. So long as you leave one part out. <laughs> that is the symposium. Fancy word for drinking party <laughs> that they would have. They would gorge themselves and then just start drinking. And they'd get crazy. Sometimes there would be prostitutes there. Paul had to deal with that in chapter 6. So <laughs> they're doing some crazy things. <clears throat> and they're mixing the two things together, this kind of party and the church worship service. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, but it's going on. And here's what Paul has to say. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17. Now in giving the following instruction, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. 
For to begin with, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. There must indeed be factions among you so that those of you who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For at the meal, each one eats his own supper ahead of others. So one person is hungry while the other person gets drunk. Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you look down on the church of God and embarrass those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you for this. So, we see the social divisions here. <clears throat> Imagine this. Again, the background. Wealthy homeowner, right? Wealthy, you don't really do work. <laughs> you have servants. So normally you have these parties and things, and you wait for your servants to bring you your wine and all the different things you need. You're used to it that way. Wait a minute. <laughs> now we're going to have a worship service in the same setting. Okay, that's great. You mean I got to wait for my slave to get off of work? I don't want to do that. That's exactly what's going on. They're not waiting. They're like, nope, let's get this party started. <laughs> and then maybe it leads to the symposium and they're drunk while their servants are hungry. So it's a new concept. What? We're all one in Jesus? You mean we come together regardless of social status? They're having a little bit of trouble with it. But Corinth is not the only church that's having this problem. James, Jesus' brother, has to deal with a similar type of issue, probably in Jerusalem. James 2, starting at verse 1, he writes, My brothers, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus. For example, a man comes in to your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor man dressed in dirty clothes also comes in. If you look with favor on the man wearing the fine clothes and say, Sit here in a good place. And yet, you say to the poor man, stand over there. Or you can sit here at my feet. Haven't you discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So, they're getting used to this radical, radical idea that everybody's one in Christ. Everybody. It's a crazy idea. Think about it. There's no other religion like it, is there? We're all one. Jesus is a servant. He washes the disciples' feet. Huh? That's crazy. It's even crazy today. It was a hard concept for people to get, the servant leadership thing. We are all equal in Christ. Paul makes this perfectly clear. Galatians 3, 28. There's no Jew or Greek. God. No social divisions. Slave or free? Gone. Male or female? Interesting. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now aside from sexism and all these other things, there's a problem. In the home church, even today when we try to do it, so can my friend, this home church, and even acknowledge, yeah, that's interesting. Naples, crazy city. It's a really weird city, kind of like Corinth, where you have billionaires and people with nothing living like right next to each other. So what if a billionaire wants to do a home church? I want to have a home church. I want to do a home church. Would someone who has nothing feel comfortable doing church there? I wouldn't feel comfortable doing church there, maybe. I don't know. It's weird. It's not just a problem of where. We have church as we saw in James. It's also what we wear to church. A little bit of a problem. I talked about this a while back of making people dress up really, really nice in church. Right? Let's say I decide, I don't know how, but whatever. I decide I'm going to start wearing Armani and Prada, right? Like I'm going to wear all the best stuff. All the best stuff. I'm going to go into my old closet. <laughs> I was in business, right? <clears throat> I'm going to start wearing all the best stuff. I think we sold it. <laughs> right? And then everybody else gets the idea that they're also going to start wearing really, really expensive clothes. We're going we're to up the bar in this place. We're going to look nice. What happens when someone comes in who can't afford to dress like that? They could feel excluded, actually. Even worse... What if we start kind of looking at them sideways because they're not wearing the right kind of clothes? 
This happens in some churches, actually. I have seen that happen. Many of you know. <clears throat> Back on the subject of being all things to all people. At the old building, if you've been with us for years, you know we were a schizophrenic church. <laughs> we had a traditional service in one area where you sung hymns like this, and then the modern church where we had like a rock band in there. And so in the modern side, I wore a t-shirt. Didn't worry about covering up my tattoos. He didn't care. I wore sneakers like JD from Hillsong. We got nuts. It was great. Then we went over to the traditional service. <laughs> and I dressed like this. Heaven forbid. You know, you wear a t-shirt in the traditional service. And it's funny. It still wasn't good enough because I wasn't quite all things to all people. I wouldn't tuck my shirt in. It caused a lot of controversy. You're laughing because it's true. I got yelled at for wearing dungarees to church. Kids, that means jeans. <laughs> you mine for gold in them. That's how they were invented. So if you're an old gold miner, you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> it happens. I've seen it happen. It happened in our church. It happened in our church. How do you think it made me feel? I'm going to get up there and lead worship anyway. They're nervous. Don't let them lie to you. <laughs> It's scary. You're going to yell at me right before I'm going to do that? And I'm trying, actually. That's the funny part. We do this. We've got to think about it. What about the hats? Think about the hats. Women, now it's your turn. <laughs> we don't do it here. But there are churches that look more like the Kentucky Derby than a church. It's real. What I'm talking about is a real thing. The women wear these big elaborate hats. Again, <laughs> the text. And they'll tell you, well, it says it in the Bible. You know, right? we got to wear hats in church. You missed the whole point of the text if you're wearing a fancy hat in church. It's about humility. The whole point's gone. So what we try to accomplish in a modern church like this one it's just a neutral place where everybody feels welcome. doesn't matter. You come whatever. Shorts, fine. Wear the shorts. I just got out of the habit of doing it. My legs are hairy. It's disgusting. <clears throat> but I do want to be both honoring and accommodating to those that come in. I don't know where everybody's going to be at. It might be a little more traditional. That's okay. I'll wear the shirt for you. Maybe not. I untuck it. Wear some jeans. Maybe I'll put some holes in them or something like that. Like, I don't know. <clears throat> Might be cool. Probably not. My daughter's laughing. There's absolutely no way you're going to accomplish cool, Dad. <laughs> you get it. There's balance. There's humility. You want to accommodate the honoring. So, as we try to make things welcoming, if you come in here, that's, we, we, we try. We try to make things welcoming. We should ask a question. What other things do we do where we make this a harder club than it already is to get into. I think we could extend this to start thinking about maybe our clicky Christian culture that we've created in some instances. Do we speak Christianese? Ever hear people do that? It's annoying. I try not to do that. People don't understand us. Do we have traditions in the church? They're not even in the Bible. <laughs> but we insist that we do them. It's important. Why? Because it makes us better than someone else? Well, I don't know. Do we even, <laughs> I'm going to get myself in trouble, in the modern context, here I go, <laughs> do we have a worship leader dress code? You ever see the big worship teams? We clearly don't hear. But, <laughs> it's okay. I'm not that picky. Right? You can think about it. If you're really into modern worship, those of you who are older, you don't follow the worship teams, you're not even getting it. But if you're younger, you're going to get it. The skinny jeans, rolled up just so, no matter what the size of your legs are. The U-neck t-shirt. The scarf, because it's cold inside on the stage, under the lights. Used to be the man bun, glad that's gone. <laughs> now it's like, Poo. I'm just going to keep my hair like this, someday it'll come back. Right? But do we have to be like one of the cool kids to get on the worship team? I don't know. 
In a lot of places, yeah. I've been on worship teams like that. There's a dress code. Just being real. <clears throat> Let's not make this a harder club than it already is to get into. So some of the traditions are nice. Dressing up is nice. If you want to do that, great. Don't be self-righteous about it. and Don't insist anybody else do it. These things are nice, but they often act as deterrents to people. Rather, in true Christianity, there's no dress requirement. Clearly says that. There's no prior experience necessary. We don't want to make people feel that way. This is why at Real Church for Real People, we invite you to come as you are. Wherever you're at in your walk with Jesus or not, welcome. I'm glad you came. Everyone is welcome at the table. So that brings me to two meals that we are having after church. We like meals here. We're going to have the Lord's Supper. We're going to gather here right after the service. Five-minute countdown thing goes on, and then come on over here prayerfully. We're going to have communion or Lord's Supper together. If you don't know what that is, I will explain it to you. We're going to dive a little bit more into the text too, because that's what Paul is talking about in that text. I invite you to come and celebrate that with us, what Jesus did for us. Also, after that, potluck up the stairs we will feed you. We want to break bread with you. And so I look forward to doing that with you after the service. Thanks.